Good morning and welcome back. This is 10 Years Hence. A brief reminder about our schedule. We will take a break for a couple of weeks. Um, we will not meet next Friday in here at 1040, but we'll in fact regather on March 23rd when Aaron Krampitz, a senior change manager from Ashoka U, will talk about social innovation. Our speaker this morning is the Reverend Larry Snyder. He comes to us from Alexandria, Virginia, where he is president of Catholic Charities USA. Father Snyder leads the national office of more than 1,700 local Catholic Charities agencies and other institutions nationwide that provide help and create hope for more than nine and a quarter million people each year, regardless of their religious, social, or economic backgrounds. Just six months after his arrival at CCUSA, Father Snyder led the network's largest disaster recovery efforts in its history in response to Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, in which more than 110 Catholic charities in the Gulf Coast and beyond provided immediate and long-term aid to more than one million victims of the hurricanes. Today, Father Snyder oversees Catholic Charities USA's work to reduce poverty in America. This multi-year, multifaceted initiative aims to cut poverty in half by the year 2020, urging Congress and the administration to give a much higher priority to the needs of the poor in budget and policy decisions. In 2007, Pope Benedict named him to the Pontifical Council Cor Unum, which oversees the church's charitable activities around the world. As president of Caritas North America, Father Snyder also serves as a vice president of Caritas Internationalis. In 2009, President Obama appointed Father Snyder to the newly created President's Advisory Council of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. For a term of two years, Father Snyder worked with the staff of the Oval Office and 24 other religious and community leaders in finding community solutions and in offering advice on policy issues to the president. In 2011, Father Snyder was honored with a Doctor of Humane Letters degree from St. Francis University in Loretto, Pennsylvania. He is uh, a bachelor's degree holder from Illinois Benedictine College in Lyle, Illinois, and has a master's degree in divinity from the St. Paul Seminary, and a Master of Public Administration from Hamlin University in St. Paul, Minnesota. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to Notre Dame, Father Larry Snyder. Good morning. And let me say, first of all, I'm delighted to be here and to receive the invitation to be a part of 10 Years Hence. Uh, I have to give a disclaimer at first, as you heard, I do not have a degree in business. So I feel a little intimidated talking to people who are uh, very conversant in that area. But I, I did bring two backups. So uh, I'd like to say Brother Joe Berg, who worked at Catholic Charities USA for 37 years, is a Holy Cross brother, now lives across the, the road here. And Tom Harvey, who needs no introduction to you folks, but who led Catholic Charities for 10 years, Tom? Or was it 11? Okay, 10 years. So, so when you ask the really difficult questions, I'm probably going to look to them for the answers. But uh, as you know, Catholic Charities uh, is the social arm of the church reaching out to those in need. So we provide kind of the whole spectrum of human services. But even while we provide those services, we also work to reduce poverty, not only with those who are already in poverty, but trying to make sure that more people who are vulnerable do not fall into poverty. So uh, what I'll be talking to you about today is kind of what will poverty look like 10 years hence? Uh, but to do that, I think we have to, first of all, know what it looks like today. And so I'll, I'll be be presenting that, what is it today? Then some hopeful signs are what I think are bridges to changing uh, what the future might look like, and then actually looking at the future. This next slide, again, I have to tell you, I'm not a big social media person, but I, I had three of my employees at the National Office uh, preview this presentation. I had them preview it because all three of them graduated from Notre Dame last year, and I thought, well, they'll give me a few good tips, I hope, 
And they said, well, first of all, you start off with this. You invite people to be part of the conversation. So, so for those of you who want to make comments, you can do that at CCUSA 2EP to end poverty. Uh, join the conversation. OK, so let's think about today. What does poverty look like? I suspect that none of these figures are new information to any of you. The fact that 46 million Americans live below the poverty line, which is about 15% of our population, or that more than one out of every five children in America live in poverty. So those are numbers we know. But does that really let you know what poverty looks like in the United States? What, what do these numbers capture or don't capture? What is the face of poverty? And quite frankly, where do these numbers come from? Well, it's no mystery. Uh, we, we know that they come from Molly Orshansky, who I'm sure is a household name for most Americans, or maybe not. She was an economist with the federal government. And in 1963, <clears throat> she decided that a good way to measure poverty was to calculate the, the federal poverty level uh, based on a family's annual food budget, okay? And she said that the food budget should be one third of your salary. And so you just take the food budget uh, for the year and multiply it by three. Think of your families. How many of your families spend one third of your income on food today? I suspect very few, I suspect very few. So. What, what these numbers say to us is that today, one person living in poverty would have to have uh, an income of at least 11,000, a family of four, an income of 22,000. There is general agreement that this is not an accurate way to depict poverty, nor is it an adequate way. Uh, well, so why is there reluctance to change it? Well, over the years, the federal government has tied many other systems to this measure. I believe including the rate of student paying back student loans. So a lot of things that have nothing to do with it are now tied to that. And so if they change this, it's going to have this ripple effect through a lot of different things. But the fact is, if we're going to address poverty, the first thing we have to do is to be able to define it. Uh, it's a 45-year-old formula, which means that when this formula was devised, people were using typewriters and carbon paper. Would anybody promote that today? I would hope not. Okay, so let's look at the current system. You know we have a safety net system in this country. Uh, we would say, to the answer the question, does it work? Yes, it, it keeps a lot of families and individuals from falling uh, through, through the cracks. It's critical to people's lives, but there are many holes in it. And this slide addresses one of those holes, uh, and it is, is hunger. So you see that in 2010, 40 million people received SNAP benefits, or what we used to call food stamps. In spite of that, 48 million people were food insecure. And so agencies like Catholic Charities were making up the difference. We served last year over 7 million people uh, relative to nutrition needs. So all of this is to give one example about if we're going to address the inadequacies of the current system, we need to accurately measure that reality. We need a different measure. So there are a few measures that have been put forward as alternatives. Uh, let me just briefly talk about these. Uh, first is the supplemental poverty measure, which you may have read about about a year ago, uh, put forward by the federal government, by the Census Bureau. And the underlying thought here was that, OK, when we, when we measure whether someone is living in poverty or not, we don't measure the government benefits they're receiving, like earned income tax credits or like food stamps. And that if we, if we measure, put those in, then actually those lift them above the poverty level. That was the thinking behind it. So it was tested. Uh, and in fact, it backfired. 
because what happened was, in fact, the number of young people and families living in poverty did reduce because these helps lifted them above. What they didn't expect, though, is at the other end of the age bracket that seniors, because they paid so much for medication, were thrown into poverty at a greater level than we were lifting young people out. So we thought we were going to get a more accurate and a lower number for people living in poverty. We ended up getting a greater number when you factor those in. <clears throat> The Opportunity Index, which is put forward by the American Human Development Project. Uh, basically, this is based on uh, the model that the United Nations uses to measure poverty in third world countries and if programs are, in fact, being effective. Uh, so they said, well, why don't we use that same measure in the United States? What is good about this, this uh, uh, index is that it's based on the, the, the premise that poverty is not monolithic in this country. It doesn't look the same in Brooklyn as it does in Wichita, in South Bend as it does in Houston. So it accounts for differences in geography, and that means the economic situation of local communities, differences in education levels, and differences in race and sex, which all impact poverty. And I'm going to, at the end, kind of give you a very uh, concrete uh, example of, of how this can be used. There is the measure of asset poverty that's put forward by CFED. And basically, uh, it measures whether families and individuals have assets. So, so what are we talking about? Do they own a house? Do they own a car? Importantly, do they have a savings account? Okay, uh, Because those are all things that act like buffers for people so that they don't slip into poverty. Um, interesting fact, in 2008, the measure, this measure said that 25% of the people in the United States had no assets. So no house, no car, no savings account. But another 25% were asset poor. And so the, the, the fear there was that all it's going to take is a little uh, downturn in the economy, and we're going to have 25% more slipping into asset poverty. So did that happen? In 2011, uh, the measure said that uh, from 25% in 2008, the number had switched to 43% of people, of Americans living asset poor. And I'll come back to that at the end as well. Another one that's being put forward, which I would think all of you would want to support wholeheartedly, because Professor James Sullivan here is the one putting it forward. It's called consumption-based measures. And this is getting a lot of traction, too, because basically what he's saying is what, the only way we can really measure poverty accurately is to say, after everybody has paid their bills, how much discretionary spending does a, a family or an individual actually have? Okay, uh, and, and that, I think, would be a more equitable an equitable measure. So we're excited and very supportive about that. Uh, just a little graph here. Again, talking about the safety net, because I think you hear politicians especially saying, I don't have to worry about the poor because we have a solid safety net in the United States. Uh, we do have a solid safety net, but is it taking care of everybody? This chart looks at the impact of government intervention, OK? And if you look, uh, among developed nations, the United States has one of the least effective governments when it comes to reducing poverty. Uh, so you can see, if we just take France here, uh, technically there should be uh, about 32, 33% of the population living in poverty. With the effect of government intervention, that is down to 7 or 8%. And you can see how that goes until you get to the United States, where we would have a 25%, but we're down to about 15% because of government intervention. Only to say that maybe our government intervention is not being as effective as it could be. Uh, interestingly, I uh, go to meetings of Caritas Internacionales, which is the church's uh, kind of broad network of national organizations that work in poverty reduction. And when I go there, I mean, I'm, I'm 
you know, there are two Americans and everybody else is from the, from the rest of the world. And they, they look at us and say, well, there's no poverty in the United States. What do you have to do? Uh, and they're shocked when we tell them the numbers of people who actually live in poverty in this country. Uh, part of it is, is that in Europe, for example, there are thresholds. There are thresholds below which the government will not let people sink. Uh, that's not true in this country uh, for many people. In this country, however, our model is that those that the government does not reach uh, are helped by charities, by philanthropy, by uh, volunteerism. So we have a different model, but I'm saying maybe our model is not as good as it could be or should be. The reality is then, if we, if we look at this as poverty in the US uh, very superficially today, we need to change. We need to change. We need to change, I think, for two reasons. Because as responsible citizens for the common good in our country, we need to take care of those who are, uh, who are disadvantaged. Uh, in a greater level, though, we need to change because it's a mandate of our faith. And we have the, the quote from Pope Benedict there, in Caritas in Veritate. And if you uh, take the time to read that encyclical, the Pope has a lot to say about the relationships between people who economically uh, have benefited and those who have not. Uh, so it's, it's not a question, I think, of if we should, but the question becomes, how should we change? Um, I think the first thing we have to do is we have to change the model or the paradigm that we're operating out of. Uh, you've got there the safety net and somebody falling into it. The problem with a net is that it also catches people, okay? So that people, once they get into it, do not have the resources or the help that they need to get out. And so maybe we need a new paradigm, a paradigm of, for example, a trampoline. And we've been saying that for five years, that we need a trampoline. Or other groups are using the paradigm of a ladder. Anyway, the, 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 what we need to see is that our paradigm tells us we need the motion out of poverty. That should be our goal. Um, as we look at this, there, there are three areas that I'm going to highlight that I think uh, can be a way to change the future. And the one is systems changing. The second is that it needs to be market driven. And the third is that it needs to be results oriented. So basically, what I'm going to do is, is, is take those three buckets, say, what do they look like today? What are hopeful signs that might be bridges out of poverty for us for tomorrow? And then finally, what could, what could the future look like? All right, so let's go to the first bucket, which is systems changing. What about our system right now? And I know my comments are going to be very simplistic, but I think they do characterize the system that we're in. Uh, today, we have kind of what we call poverty in a box. It comes out of Washington, it goes to every community, and it's one size fits all, okay? The problem is, and, and, and there's unbelievable bureaucratic silos that surround that, the problem is, that that does not take into account people's individual situations. So for example, you get a city like Detroit where there are, for historical reasons, not good public transportation systems. Okay, a lot of people live in the inner city. The jobs, for the most part, are in the suburbs. There's no transportation for them. <clears throat> so you would think, if we really want to solve that, We'll, we'll develop good transportation systems, right? Well, but that doesn't fit into the box that we've got from Washington. So therefore, we see if they need food and we keep doing that or something else, but we don't give them the one thing that will get them out of poverty. And so that's kind of what I'm saying uh, in the fact that poverty is not monolithic. Every community has its own issues and should address those, those same issues. What are some bridges that are could maybe help us get out of this. Well, we do have some programs that do have that kind of discretion built into them. And one of these, one of them is the Refugee Resettlement Program. Uh, you may not know it, but the Catholic Church is the largest resettler of refugees into this country than, than any other organization. Um, and if you, when, when they come, refugees we recognize bring 
assets with them. And what we try to do then is uh, tailor the aid that they need to get up on their feet to the assets that they have. So we look, we base this on clients' needs and strengths. And it works. As the, uh, the, the, the figure there says, 98% of refugees who received employment services from Catholic Charities of Atlanta became employed and economically self, self-sufficient within six months of arrival. 98%. Why? Big reason is because we could tailor uh, what we were giving them to their needs. The same is true with disaster response. When there's a natural disaster, basically the government lets us go in and it puts all these waivers on programs that normally people would have no access to. So that when somebody comes in and they say, no, my house is okay, but I need this. I say, oh, sorry, we can only give you housing allowance. We don't have that a kind of a restriction. You get a lot of waivers at a time like that. Well, we think discretionary funding is a key, is a key here and is a bridge out of it because these work, these work. And Poverty is not a natural disaster. It's actually one that, that we, we have helped make, but uh, we, we have choices there to make. So what could the future look like? Well, I think in 10 years, if we have programs that, first of all, focus on individuals. What I've been talking about before is when somebody comes in for help, what do we focus on? Their deficits. What if we focused on their assets? That's what we should be focusing on. We could, we could develop individual opportunity plans, okay, that would directly, would directly affect where people are at. Uh, the thing about it is, is that poverty, just as it's, it looks different in, in various uh, communities, it also looks different for individuals. You have people who are poor because of what we call situational poverty. They've got the skills, they've got the training, they've been employed, they've, they've all that, but something comes along, some crisis, and knocks them out from under their feet. So what do they need? They need a hand up for a certain period of time until they get back on their feet and have found another job or established another business and, uh, because we know they have the skills already to do so. That's situational poverty, and it's the easiest to deal with. Then there's generational poverty where uh, people are born into a family that has lived below the poverty line for several generations. For the most part, they do not have the skills. I think I just shut something off. They do not have the skills uh, to, to just get into the job force. It takes more of an effort to, to give them the skills that they need as well as kind of the whole context of, of a work situation. So it takes more work. And then you've got people we call supportive, in the kind of the supportive area, that probably will never totally be able to be independent. Most of these folks uh, have, suffer from some mental illness that even with medication uh, might limit them. Uh, some of its dependencies on drugs, alcohol, <clears throat> and uh, I would say here, an interesting thing is a fair number of people in this category are veterans who are suffering from their, their experiences in war. And so they will always need some kind more, something more supportive. But, but those are three different tiers. We can't expect all three of these groups of people to respond to the same, to the same program that, that makes no uh, uh, accommodation to their situation. So that's the first thing about systems changing. We move on to uh, the lack of marketplace engagement. Okay, so this is today. Today, I think when corporations hear a call from me or any other nonprofit uh, person, they're thinking, you want money, you want a grant, and corporations are very generous. But I think maybe there's a different way for them to, to engage with us. So today also, the vast majority of money that's being put into here is coming from the government. The government, I think, does have a responsibility here. Uh, so it's not like we want to let them off the hook. But <clears throat> that makes programs susceptible to politics, to the economy, and swings in philanthropy and volunteers. An example is, if you take all the Catholic Charities organizations across the country, uh, our combined budget our aggregate budget last year was about $4.3 billion. 
Three billion dollars of that came from the government for the, the direct services that we, uh, we were providing. Um, that's probably not the healthiest uh, balance. But again, I firmly believe the government has a responsibility and should be there. The other piece about this is, is there is already a market that's thriving because of poverty, what we call poverty pimps. So payday loan folks, pawn shops, slumlords, they are making money on people who live in poverty. Is that the way we want to do it? Well, I think there are some examples of folks who, are, who have done it a different way. Uh, beginning with the banking uh, industry, uh, the Grameen Bank. I suspect many of you are acquainted with it. Uh, uh, Professor Mohammed Yunus began it in 1983, and they target poverty pockets across the country and will go in and make loans to people specifically who live below the poverty line, and usually they, they target women. Uh, and what they find is that the loan recovery rate, as you can see, is 96 0.67%, which I believe is higher than that loan recovery rate for the, the normal banking uh, industry. It is a profit-based model. When you hear Professor Yunus speak, he says, you know, I'm, I'm glad people are giving me all these awards, but they're giving me awards for making money. I am not a philanthropist. I am a businessman. And all I'm doing is giving people uh, loans at rates they can afford, and believing in them that they will. So, but that's bringing a whole different business model into the, uh, into the arena. You have the state of Minnesota recently, last year, uh, adopted the first social impact bonds. So we have bonds for lots of different things in this country, but to my knowledge, they were the first ones to adopt social impact bonds. Um, one that should be up there that, that's not our uh, kind of the development of what we're calling B corporations, benefit corporations, corporations that are set up as for profit, but only to make uh, the profit to then be given to charity. Uh, I suspect you know some examples of those, but uh, perhaps the, the most well-known is Newman's Own. Any of you use the salad dressing and everything else? All the profits go to charity. But there are reasons he wanted to set it up as a for-profit corporation, a lot of them uh, dealing with research and development issues. Okay, so those are bridges that I think are hopeful. What will the future look like? Well, I think it will be asking business to come to look at poverty with an entrepreneurial attitude, that there is a way here to make money, but to do it in a way that actually benefits people who are most in need. One of the big issues here is research and development. Every corporation has research and development dollars, right? And they may spend a fair amount uh, on trying to develop 10 product lines. Of those 10 product lines, how many have to succeed? I'm not sure, you probably know, but I'm thinking if they get one to succeed, they're probably gonna be in the black. But uh, the same is not true with nonprofits. We do not have that luxury. If someone gives us money to run a program and the program fails, then the money's cut off for good. Rather than say, what can we learn from this and, and how can we design better programs for that? So I, I think it's that spirit that we have to also bring to our, um, our work in reducing poverty. Um, we could expand community development, financial institutions, the earned income tax credit, develop a new capital market for poverty services through community renewal bonds and create community renewal incentives that monetize the savings. And I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. Okay, that's the second bucket, okay? We go to the third bucket. It's going to be uh, focusing on outcomes instead of outputs. Okay, what do I mean by that? As nonprofits, uh, we're very proud of the, the, the data that we have about how many shelter beds we filled last year or how many meals that we served last year. And we should be proud of that because that is making a difference in people's lives who are vulnerable. Uh, the problem is none of those figures tell us but how many people actually got out of poverty then because of that. And it's almost like we need to reset the goal here because 
uh, if the goal is to get people out of poverty, it shouldn't be then just how, how proud we are of how many more shelter beds we had. Uh, so this will only happen, I think, though, if we, if we measure the results that we're getting. I want to give you one example. Uh, there is a uh, <clears throat> nonprofit in St. Paul, Minneapolis called Twin Cities Rise. Uh, it was founded by Steve Rothschild. He was a vice president for General Foods, which is a big thing in Minneapolis. I mean, if you go to Minneapolis, there's Betty Crocker Drive and all those good things. But uh, he was responsible for developing the Yo Play yogurt <laughs> brand, uh, which again, I suspect most people know, and it was uh, one of the first. So he was very successful. But after he did that, he thought, do I want to develop another brand, or do I want to make a different kind of contribution? And he took his business mind and an entrepreneurial spirit and said, I'm going to help people get jobs. And he, and he uh, founded Twin Cities Rise. An interesting thing here is that when, when he was set about doing this, you first of all, you have to define who is your customer, right? For us who grew up in the nonprofit system, we say, well, our customer is the person who comes in the door and needs a job, right? He, for him, he said, no, my customer is the person who's going to hire that person. So that's who I have to design a program around so that when the person is through this program, they will be the perfect candidate for who my customer is. But uh, it seems maybe not to be that big of a switch. It's a huge switch. It's a huge switch. Anyway, but the, the most amazing thing that he did, though, <clears throat> is that he went to the state legislature and he said, uh, I'm going to find uh, 150 people uh, employment at a good rate, and therefore I'm taking, I'll be taking them off the state rolls for, for various uh, benefits that they get. Therefore, I'm saving you money, and I've calculated out how much money I'm saving you, and what I want you to do is I want you to keep half of that money, but I want you to give me the other half. And the thing is, they bought it, and they've been doing that for many years now, and, uh, and it works. And it works. So that's what we, when we talk about monetizing savings, it does work. So uh, the results is that 624% of the return to Minnesota taxpayers. For every $1 they invested, $7.24 was returned from increased state tax receipts and reduced state subsidies. Uh, so you can see, these are the, uh, I bring this, this is a bridge. This is somebody who's thinking in a different way, who's bringing a different context to it, and, and it's working. Another bridge are child trust funds. Uh, big thing in the United Kingdom. Uh, there, every child uh, receives $500 to $1,000 from the government to open a savings account. Uh, so what's the big deal? Well, it's, it's the bottom line here. Children are seven times more likely to go to college if they have savings set aside for education. Uh, and that is supported by multiple studies that have linked net worth with college enrollment uh, independent of other factors. It's an idea worth doing. Uh, as you can see, the only place that I'm aware of in the United States that that has happened is in San Francisco, where they are piloting this, uh, a movement called kindergarten to college. Uh, but again, if you give people assets, their outlook on life becomes totally different, totally different. So with those bridges, what are the kinds of things that we can look at? Well, we need to revamp our programs so that they are results-oriented. Um, we need to use program evaluation and accountability and have measurable, uh, measurable outcomes. We need to use data tracking technologies, systematic reporting, design a new system of client advocacy where you don't go in and have a caseworker, but you have either a mentor or a coach. Again, that makes a big difference. Uh, we brought together people from all across the country who had received uh, help from Catholic Charities in a, in a variety of ways to do kind of a, a focus group with them about, oops, There we go. A focus group with them about uh, what was the most 
critical thing for them to get them out of poverty. And they all said, well, you know, the aid or the, this, the training, all of that was very helpful. But to a person, what they said, the most important thing you gave me was you believed in me, and that gave me the courage to believe in myself. So again, when you go in and you think of somebody as your, uh, the person who's just taking care of your file, it's very different than if somebody's treating you as if they're your coach or your mentor and the ways we need to do that. Uh, a new technology platform. Uh, we've developed it for almost every other, every other aspect of life in America, but not the nonprofit human services. Um, there, this is being done uh, already in Silicon Valley with about three of our agencies in California. They're working on this, which again, I think is a, is a great step forward. Um, I want to talk here about something that I think is very exciting. And the fact that uh, over the last year, we've been having conversations with the Department of Economics here at Notre Dame about establishing a poverty lab a poverty lab. And in fact, it looks like it's going to become a reality. And why is this so important? Well, again, it goes back to that research and development and, and really understanding what works, what doesn't work. And right now, we don't have a lot of options for that. What this uh, poverty lab, which we're calling LEO, or uh, the Laboratory for Economic Opportunities does, is that it will focus on domestic poverty, and there are other poverty labs in this country, but they focus on international poverty. The second unique thing about it is, is that it will be done in partnership with Catholic Charities, which means, uh, to my knowledge, for the first time you have, at this level, sorry, I keep doing that, uh, at this level, academics and practitioners who are coming together. And that's where I think it could have an amazing, an amazing impact. So next week, there's going to be six economists, uh, two from here, four from around the country, as well as six practitioners, Catholic Charities heads, coming here to campus for a few days to have this initial meeting about what will this look like, what kind of projects can, can really make an impact. Uh, I, I think it's, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, opportunity for, for all of us. I don't want to uh, discount either the progress that has ma been made on the international level. Uh, we talked about poverty labs. Uh, I think many of you are acquainted with Jay Powell at MIT and Stanford Institute for Innovation and Developing Economics. <clears throat> we also have figures where uh, the Grameen Bank, for example, for them, 68% of their borrowers' families moved out of poverty because of this. 68%, a phenomenal number. And the World Health Organization said that for every dollar that's invested in clean water uh, yields $8 in increased productivity. So we have some of those figures that show the great progress is being done on the international level. Uh, our question is, we need to be able to document and promote that kind of, uh, of progress on the domestic level as well. OK, those are my three buckets, right? So where do we go? Well, what we're committed to at Catholic Charities is not only to continue providing services as part of the safety net, but to just as much to work forward to reducing poverty in America. And in 2007, <clears throat> we set this goal of reducing poverty by 50% by the year 2020. Uh, the reality is we're not doing so well. In 2007, it was 12.5%, and now it's 15%. 0.1%, but we're not giving up because I think if we, we will never get there by just doing more of what we're doing, but if we can change systems and approach this differently, it can have a tremendous impact. Uh, the other thing from the folks who are saying, never be done, can't be done. We've done it already. There is an historical precedent that if you look at 1959, the poverty level in this country was 22.4%. By 1973, it had come down to 11.1%. Okay? That wasn't an accident. Uh, there were a lot of things that came together in that time period that really promoted this and made it happen. So uh, th that's the important thing, I think, for us to think, that if we have the willpower and we are open to, to doing things differently, it can happen. <clears throat> 
Um, what if we don't? Well, there's three projections here about where poverty will pretty much stay in this country. And I said the 11.1%, we've never gone below that. Okay. <clears throat> These projections come from uh, the top one is the Economist Intelligent Unit, which is those who are associated with The Economist magazine. There's the Office of Management and Budget, and there's the Congressional Budget Office. And you can see while it plateaus, uh, going out, uh, we're still going to be up around 14% with a good projection for, for everybody. For children, it's not quite as good. Uh, there you see it's ranging anywhere from 25% down to uh, 21 or 22 percent, okay? Well, let's go back now. According to the federal poverty guidelines we're using right now, these are our statistics for national poverty. Uh, our poverty rate is 15.3, and you can see the numbers who live in poverty, urban areas, rural areas, and those who live in child poverty. Uh, let's take it down to Indiana. You see, the, the percentage is exactly the same as the national percentage, um, but uh, looks, looks a little different uh, as far as rural versus urban. This is the state of Indiana, and the darker the color, the greater the poverty. Now, I'm not from here. You, you probably know these counties better than I, but I suspect you all know St. Joseph County. Uh, an interesting fact about this is that there are more children living in poverty in this county than there are students here at Notre Dame, and that's about 12,000 students. So uh, not, a, not a good figure. Okay, that's all using the current poverty thing. Let's, let's now look at a different one. This is the assets and poverty and opportunity scorecard put out by CFED. If you look at that, Indiana's overall ranking here is 35th out of 50. Um, you've got asset poverty, which uh, I talked to you about, and it, it is about 13.8% here. Liquid asset poverty means that uh, these are assets that can be easily uh, uh, accessed, like cash or bank accounts, things like that. So it's, it's higher there. Um, you can see that the businesses and jobs rate uh, is F. A lot of that depends on unemployment, underemployment, business ownership, and uh, so it's Indiana ranks 47th among all states in that category. Let's take a look at the Opportunity Index. And this is, again, from the Human Development Project. And this is where they take into account the uniqueness of your uh, your local county situation. So they're, they're basing this off of census, census data that they have. And so for Indiana, you basically, out of 10, have scores of five, four, and six. Uh, interesting thing that they say is your zip code has a lot to do to determine whether you're gonna live in poverty or not. So checking that out, let's, let's go into the Opportunity Index and check out a few zip codes. First one we're going to do is Fairfax County, Virginia, where our national office is, right across the thing. So 22314. And let's see how people in suburban Washington, D.C. are faring. Okay, try 22312 so we can get, get the county of Fairfax. Alexander, that's a great score, though, 5, 5, and 4. Five, five, and five. Pretty good, eh? And uh, what you can see is it gives you the median household income, 104000 Now, we're going to come to St. Joseph County, so kind of remember these. Uh, banking institutions per 1000 uh, renter spending that is greater than 30% of their household income, high-speed Internet rating. All of these are determiners about poverty. Education, what is on-time high school graduation? 85%, that's great. Preschool enrollment, a bachelor's degree or higher, 58%. Violent crime, uh, homicides, 2.7. So all of that adds up to, this would be a pretty good community to live in, actually. Uh, let's do St. Joseph County.
okay, three, three, <clears throat> and a four. Remember the median household income for uh, Fairfax County was over 100,000. Here it's 44,000. Population below the poverty line, 13%. Um, on time high school graduation was 85, here it's 70. Bachelor's degree or higher, here it's 25, and there it was, what was it, 85 or something, I forget. But um, again, anybody have a zip code you want to throw out? 46530. Four, six, it's all St. Joseph County. Anybody, throw out a zip code. 14215. Where are we headed? Erie. Okay. 343. Three. Median household income, 46%. Unemployment rate lower than here. So, bachelor's degree or higher? Once, once more? 07760. Okay, not bad. Monmouth, New Jersey. You see the income is up, uh, but so are all on time graduation, bachelor's degrees. Uh, 60302. 60302. Where are we at? Cook County, all right. Now, does anybody know DuPage County? That would be, take a look at this, and then let's look at DuPage. Does anybody know DuPage? 605-14. Okay, a little difference, eh? On time high school graduation, 100%. You can do this. You can go on their, on their homepage and, and look up your thing. But the fact is, your zip code is a determinant in whether you're going to live in poverty or not. So, I, again, I think this at least starts to give us more facts about what is the face of poverty. And it takes it down to where you live. So, I think we'll, we'll head back then. Let's look at this. If we... If we look at the whole country then, because each state has also an opportunity number, uh, where is the best place to live? Well, the darker the state, the, better, the higher the opportunity index. The highest is Connecticut, okay, and its score is 6.3. The lowest, West Virginia. Now, that has changed, because they do this every two years. Two years ago, the lowest was Mississippi. And I haven't seen the demographics for this because they're fairly new. Uh, but it used to be, what would you have the greatest odds of success? Would be to be born a white male in Connecticut. And two years ago, it was the worst odds were to be born a black female in Mississippi. Uh, but it, it can give you that kind of data. And the fact is, as it says, we're a nation of extremes. This, however, <clears throat> does not give you the whole picture. Because even though you look at the state of Minnesota, it's the highest one, right? <clears throat> I mean, as far as it's the darkest color. What happens when we take it down to congressional districts? You see that actually two-thirds of the state lives in poverty, uh, has, has a very low index, whereas um, around the Twin Cities area, that's what's really cranking up the state rate. Look at Arizona, same thing. Uh, you, you can tell me right where Phoenix is, right? Um, the lowest, or the highest congressional district is Manhattan, right? The lowest, Fresno, California. But you can see the disparity even among states. Of course, there are several states up there that have only one congressional district, so. Uh, uh, well, anyway, that's, these are some interesting things that help us, I think, get a better understanding about poverty in this country. I want to stop then.
and say, first of all, Catholic Charities here and now is totally committed to providing critical services and being a part of the safety net in this country. That's not questioned. But we are just as committed to changing systems in the future so that so many people are not facing a life with a lack of opportunity. So the three things I think that we need, we need to change systems, we need to be market driven, and we need to be results oriented. Uh, because if we're going to keep doing what we're doing, we're going to keep getting the same thing that we've got. Uh, two uh, two uh, commercials, and then I really will end. One is that this summer we're recruiting uh, 10 Notre Dame students to become poverty solutions interns at our office in Washington, D.C., or at Alexandria. Uh, next Thursday at 6 p.m., uh, there's going to be an information session about this with, with Candy Hill, who is our Vice President for um, Public Policy and Government Relations. So you'll have time to meet with her and talk about what these internships mean. And uh, the other reason for coming is there's free pizza. So if, if nothing else, you can do that. Uh, and then the last announcement is this, that uh, I actually wrote a book uh, called Think and Act Anew, which incorporates a lot of these things that we did but it, it ties it much more into uh, our Holy Father's encyclical Caritas and Veritate than I have done today. Uh, it shows that as a basis, of, that encyclical gives us to really propel us to think about these in different ways. There are some copies here. If you're interested, you're welcome to them on the way out. So, and with that, I think uh, I'm gonna end my, okay. Any questions? Uh, this year, no. This year, no. But if you li live in this year, I mean, we always have to think of the, the potential uh, there. I, I think, um, well, let me just do an aside here. <clears throat> uh, this was kind of all developed as part of our centennial uh, celebration, which was in 2010. And we had 10 listening sessions around the country where we invited uh, people who have any kind of a stake in, in human services to come, and we just listened. We listened to what was working, we listened to what was broken, and we listened to their ideas. So a lot of this has come from listening to people across the country. And then we pulled together 40 people at a summit and said, what would a piece of legislation look like that incorporates these ideas? <clears throat> we drafted it, and it's called the National Opportunity and Community Renewal Act. And Senator Casey of Pennsylvania actually has introduced it. He introduced it at the time of our centennial. Um, what this, do we think that this act, legislative act, is going to be the, uh, the panacea? No. Uh, it, it's a vehicle, though, for conversation. And basically what we're trying to do is to move these three ideas forward. And uh, so to answer your question, I don't think that that act will get passed in its form. It basically sets up 10, uh, ten pilot areas that, that are allowed by the government to, to test this and see if they really, really will work. But uh, I do think that it helps us, the more we can, t we can get people on board with the concepts, the greater, uh, the greater uh, likelihood of actually coming up with things. The other thing I'd say is it's very rare that something this transformational comes out of Washington. It's going to be done somewhere on a local level first and proven to be, to be effective. And then we can, we can take that conversation forward. Okay, I have a comment about the map of Indiana with the uh, poverty rates. One county that was high was the second county east of here. Two counties south of Fort Wayne were. Those counties have quite a few Amish. Uh, see, but, and that's, that's the kind of things that you need to understand if you're going to really understand locally what, what it is. Thank you. Sure. 
Uh, what do you see as the role of government um, at different levels, the federal, state, local, in the reduction of poverty? Okay. Um, it's an interesting thing, because if you ask a lot of people, especially people in Congress, uh, what is the role of government, they'll say, well, national security, primarily, period. Uh, in our tradition, our Catholic tradition, we say that the role of government is to promote the common good, especially for those who are most marginalized. <clears throat> so we, we would say that the government has always had a responsibility, and this goes back centuries, uh, to care for those who are less fortunate. Uh, the, the reality is they're the only one who also has the systems on such a large scale that can really make uh, a dent as well. If, if we were to uh, rely simply on private philanthropy, uh, we would never, ever get to the, to the numbers that we need to, uh, to make, a, make an impact. And I'm not knocking private philanthropy. I'm just saying it's, it's a huge, huge problem. So I think it's government. Does government need to do it directly? No, government has partnered with nonprofits and others uh, for a long time uh, in doing this. Does anybody know when the first government federal grant was made? 1871. You know who it was given to? The Little Sisters of the Poor in Washington, D.C., to care for senior citizens who were living in poverty. So it, we have a long history of working with the government, with them I identifying uh, issues that we both care about, but then the government you know, subsidizing it so that we can, in fact, make an impact. So the federal government has that kind of a role. State governments and particularly counties uh, through most state uh, systems is, is where it gets, where the rubber hits the road. It's the county that really has that responsibility, but, but they get dollars flowing in from Washington. And so so I, I think, yeah, the government has a definite role here. I don't know if I'm answering it exactly. Uh, do you have a follow-up question or is that kind of, okay, thanks. Brother Joe. Yeah, Larry, great presentation. As we prepare for a major dialogue in the year over Social Security, these statistics are going to have to kind of be re-skewed to, to, to kind of pull out the seniors and where they all fit into this thing called poverty. It, it, you just touched on it. It's, to me, it's, it's a major, major issue. It is. And an interesting thing about that is, is that we, we talk about Social Security and people forget that when it was implemented, it was implemented as an anti-poverty program because of the huge percentage of seniors in this country who were dying in poverty. And so Social Security was meant to be their safety net, their, their uh, blanket that's going to protect them. Another interesting thing about that is, is that if you go back to how that was passed uh, in Congress, uh, my predecessor at that time was Monsignor John O'Grady. And uh, in the congressional record, his, his name appears many times that he was one of the people who was most stringent and strident in, in uh, working for the passage of that. So uh, it's just, again, I think Catholic Charities has, has always been kind of pushing the envelope about things that need to happen. We just take Social Security for granted at this point, right? Uh, but like I say, originally, uh, it, it was a fight. To, to adopt it, and now I think we, we can't change it so that we, we don't see that it still is an anti-poverty program at its most basic level. Sure. Uh, you spoke a little bit about microfinance and the Grameen Bank, um, and normally that business plan is discussed in the context of foreign markets and third world countries. However, is it being implemented here in the U.S.? And if not, do you think that it could play a role in contributing to the trampoline model rather than the safety net? It is. In fact, uh, Grameen Bank, I believe, is in like four cities in this country already. Uh, it, one of them is, I believe, in Indianapolis. Uh, but it's Brooklyn, Indianapolis, Des Moines, and there might be one more. Uh, so, so they are starting to, to make a little headway here. Uh, but there are other banks who have uh, kind of taken that socially conscious piece and investment in uh, areas that are uh, more neglected. Uh, I believe, I, and I don't know if this is still happening, but South Shore Bank in Chicago had a real commitment to this as well. So th there are other places that it's happening. Excluding people who have high incomes. 
Um, we do not have a position on that. Uh, I think it's something that we probably should look at, though, uh, because, uh, again, our, our concern would be the other end of the spectrum, making sure that those folks uh, who are paying, you know, 50% of their income on medication right now or, or more. I mean, you hear stories from our folks out in the, uh, in the field about uh, people who don't get to eat today because they had to pay for their medication and stuff. And that's, that would be our, wor our worry. Uh, but I think that that should be a serious discussion that is had. Sure. I think they are effective. I think they, that they've been shown to be effective. And I mean, it's, it's just as important to keep the middle class from sliding down as it is. So I mean, you, you can't have a strategy that is just focused on the people who are already there. You got to have a strategy too to keep any more people from getting there. And that does mean shoring up the middle class so that they have uh, the assets that they need not to go down there. So, um, so yeah, I, I, Mike, from what my understanding is that, in fact, they are effective. That, does that mean everyone? I, I, I can't say that. Uh, you'd have to look at each one uh, specifically as to what it targets. Interesting thing about the NOCRA that I was talking about is that there's support from both sides of the aisle for this uh, uh, piece of legislation, but not for the same reasons. Uh, Democrats like it because of certain things that are in it. Republicans like it because there are other things in it. and. Uh, I'm hopeful because that's usually a sign of a good piece of legislation when you can get at least everybody has something in there that they that they like. Other questions? A clear policy change for alleviating poverty is education. And um, what steps are Catholic Charities USA taking proactively in this field, if any? Okay. Um, well, I think in the, in the very practical level, I mean, Head Start programs are, in fact, implemented by Catholic Charities. Uh, you look at any kind of job training or skill development programs, we do a lot of that. Uh, for the most part, we don't run schools, but we have partners, I think, that, that do, and that's something that we very strongly support, um, especially uh, uh, early childhood education. I, again, studies there are, are very clear uh, about how you can predict if somebody is going to graduate from high school. So, and I've, you probably heard it, if you're, if you're reading at a third grade level, in the third grade, chances are overwhelming you're going to graduate from high school. If you're not, if you've already fallen behind, it's almost impossible at that point to catch up. So you see a lot of programs where that, that are being done uh, in early childhood education to make sure that people are starting off on the right foot. And, and they, it works. It works. So th those are the kinds of investment in education, I think, that, that we, we support wholeheartedly because we, if it doesn't happen, we deal with, with the results on the other end. Any other? Tom, I, are you going to, you, you've had more years of experience than me in this. So you, you probably. I'll say a couple. and places like that, you're going to have quality education because there's a support base. So one of the issues in a policy way is to try to find ways to use mechanisms at the state level particularly to overcome that. That begs the question of the creativity of burnout education systems, but I think that has to be put on the plate. But since Notre Dame students are heavily involved in services, I'd just like to add one other thing. 
Michael Harrington, who is now dead, but he was sort of the apostle of the poor in the 60s and 70s, used to say, if you're going to be poor, it's better to be poor with the majority. Like the 30s, we got good social legislation because poverty was a national problem and so viewed. If you happen to live in one of those counties like DuPage or Montgomery or Fairfax, you really should become an apostle for the poor because there's usually less infrastructure to either understand them or to help them. And the role of places like Catholic Charities, Volunteers of America, Lutheran Services, and other human services are even more vital than they are in some of the blighted communities. With regard to the aging issue, I, I think one thing I would add to what Father Schneider said, the Social Security Act was basically a transfer, an entitlement transfer from working people to non-working. And one of the crises today that comes with unemployment and, a, and a, an exploding number of elderly is that assumption is as something that has to be looked at. But over the years, this has been seen as coming. So the Older Americans Act, which rarely gets across the board reenacted, instead pieces of it get enacted. That was the real safety net. Children in this country are much more vulnerable than the elderly because they don't have a Social Security Act. The elderly do from the 1930s, but the poverty has to rely on poverty relief programs such as the Older Americans Act. Now, when 20% of your nation's children are living in poverty, and that's your future workforce, these issues around education, where you're born, what kind of a support system, and what are the ways of keeping the middle class from falling out, because they're the lower part of the middle class are the ones that have a lot of these children. So the complexities that Larry has raised, if we're going to call this 10 year hence, the, the, the odds are against us right now because we haven't recovered from being an industrial economy to being a service economy. The jobs that used to free people, like steel mills where I come from in Pittsburgh, are not there in great amounts. So those of you graduating from a business school, if you take the mindset that Carolyn Wu has instilled in us, ask more of business, that's an incredibly important thing. Because economic investment to build on those assets that Father Schneider has so brilliantly alluded to is much better than trying to reduce anger, addiction, and all the other problems. When we try to fix problems, it's almost incurable frequently. But when we use economic empowerment through things like the GI Bill, the Social Security Act, and other things that had systemic impact, then eventually we move forward to the kind of a desire the Catholic social teaching calls us to. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tom. Let, let, me, uh, go ahead. let me just say, uh, too, uh, as somebody who works in poverty every day, a lot of times people will say to me, what a depressing job you must have. And I, I honestly can say, it's just the opposite. I, I am so hopeful because of what all I see happening. And, and I just want to say, too, one of the hopeful things for me is uh, coming to Notre Dame. We've been coming now for five or six years, uh, maybe more. Uh, we're here at, at the uh, Mendoza School where our leadership is trained through a, a program called From Mission to Service. And it's been phenomenal. And it's been this leaven throughout all of our uh, network and but what we also do is come into contact with uh, a whole mindset or outset of look, looking at life of giving back of making a difference i mean you look at the ace program look at the center for social concern and and the students we've come into contact with it's a very hopeful thing and i i'm very grateful to that because we feel it's very simpatico with what we're trying to do at catholic charities usa uh, the other thing i would say is those three recent graduates who are back at my office, they would like nothing more than to, to see you tweet because they're going to be reading all of them. Uh, that, that would kind of make their day if I could do a commercial there. Thanks. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.